I am um, Andre Perry. Currently, I'm the Associate Dean for the College of Education and Human Development at the University of New Orleans and the CEO of the Capital One UNO Charter Network. But I'm transitioning to Loyola University to head their effort to restart their education initiatives there. Could you tell me something about this Charter Network? Yeah, the, the Charter Network is a compilation of six schools four of which are directly managed by the Capital One UNO Charter Network and the network, the Capital One um, comes from a donation um, from Capital One. Um, they've given um, um, lots of money to help in the recovery efforts, but the network actually began before the storm, starting with two schools, Pierre Capto and Medard Nelson uh, Elementary ch um, and Middle Charter Schools. Um, and then after this storm, we eventually expanded to two more schools, another elementary, Gentilly, uh, uh, Gentilly Terrace School, and Thurgood Marshall Early College High School. So the network is, has six schools total, but four are directly managed by the UNO group. You know, I, I think of you as a you know, sort of policy wonk, academic, um, can you talk a little bit how one goes from being an academic and a commentator to being a chief executive? Well, at some point you got to put your money where your mouth is. And I think a lot of folks in New Orleans can analyze the situation, but there was such a need for human resources in the city that eventually the university asked me to help uh, manage the four schools. And so um, right after the storm, I was an analytic resource. But then I became a resource for the university in, in helping to manage. And, and it's a, it's, it makes sense because I have a, a, a pretty extensive policy background. And, and much of what goes on in New Orleans in terms of reform is about policy reform. And so I really focused in on the, those areas while I certainly had help on the operation side. There must be a some sort of big difference though between you know being on TV and talking and suddenly well I think my I've always I've always seen myself as a scholar activist so what I say on television is, is what I say in the boardrooms um, in private meetings my job is to give um, folks sort of the rudimentary um, knowledge to help um, move schools and policy in a direction that um, helps um, in the recovery. And also, but also just to provide a critical lens because um, this reform world can be very ideological. And I think what a, a, an analytic uh, or a scholar perspective uh, brings to the table is, uh, is uh, we, we look at the trade-offs. There's pluses here, but there's minuses in this area. And so that's what I, I, I like to think I bring to the table. You, you said use the adjective ideological um, and, and in reference to this reform. Would you talk a little bit about this? Oh, man, it, because um, you'll hear the word movement um, tossed around quite frequently. And when you're just talking about movement, you're talking about not only sound principles, but an agenda that is somewhat uncompromising. And so um, you have clearly uh, this neoliberal market-driven reform, but then you have traditionalists who um, will stand by their principles. So you have very distinct positions that people are presenting um, when we're, we're talking about reform. Yeah, I, I've been talking to different folks, um, you know, people on the left saying, well, this is, you know, this is a right-wing privatizing, et cetera, et cetera, business model. Um, it, it, you say, Ideological and to, is it is ideology? Uh, I wonder. If some would say that it can get in the way. I mean, I I'm just curious your thoughts about the how how strong an ideology is this privatizing. Well, I you know I think it's a, a lot more complicated than that because certainly um, the, not and just put it in these terms the the neoliberal movement are largely. Democrats, um, it's not this extremely conservative um, group that's pushing charter schools for the most part. However, it's 
conveniently fits in to a conservative framework. No question, when you're talking about markets, you're talking about conservative uh, principles. But, um, but this is embraced by maybe, you know, to put it um, um, in common language, sort of the limousine liberals who are, are pushing market-driven approaches. Um, but these are folks who really want change. The, other, the flip side of it is um, the, the, the thousands of bodies trapped outside of the Superdome Convention Center was somewhat evidence that we needed change. Typically, when you're talking about education reform, you're, you're looking for reasons why you need to reform. And, and clearly, we had the starkest evidence that people were trapped, partly because they weren't getting a, a quality education. And so we needed change. And so um, when I hear folks saying that it's a, you know, a right-wing sort of um, um, agenda that's uh, being imposed on us, I, I go, well, don't sound like a party of no, just saying we can't have change offer something different. And I think that's what the reform, reformers are offering, something different. Typically, the, the major players of um, this reform, you, you're seeing um, the national uh, nonprofits like Teach for America, um, New Teacher Fu um, Project, you're looking at Venture Fund, but also the major foundations, Bill and uh, Melinda Gates, um, um, Broad, Fisher, um, Walton, these foundations are pushing market-driven approaches. Now, that's not a bad thing because in their minds, they're looking for change um, and they're looking at um, um, the failures of a traditional system. And so, but there's clearly a movement afoot to say that we need um, data-driven, um, you, uh, new human capital and all those buzzwords you hear um, to push change in, in education. And it certainly, uh, we were starting from square one. I mean, there, there were some people who said, well, yes, Katrina and the flooding were a tragedy, but they're also an opportunity. Is that? Uh, yeah, the only thing I, I, I say to that is, when you hear this wipe the slate clean, start from scratch, people don't disappear. You know, people are still here. And when you're talking about um, changing the human capital, well, what do you do with people who are here? I, I like to take a human development approach to say, hey, we need to change, but we have to develop people along the way. Uh, to, to, get, to say that adults um, can't get in the way of reform is illogical because one, children become adults, Children are connected to adults. Yes, there are adult issues, and they matter. Um, certainly, we have to prioritize um, in terms of um, changing school where in the hierarchy of change these things fall, but they all matter. Now, we're, we're you know, basically mid-2011. Mm -hmm. uh, talk a little bit about, uh, well, I guess maybe the missteps. We'll talk about what's going well. You know, what's going well and what hasn't gone as well as it could have. Well, I think for me, the major factor is that we really got to focus on creating a diverse workforce. I think we talked a little bit about ideologies and, and how they manifest themselves is in the teaching class, uh, the teaching cores of our schools. You'll see some schools with, you know, complete Teach for America, 20-something-year-olds in the classroom, largely white. And then you'll see some schools with, 50-something-year-old um, veteran teachers, largely black. And for me, it's always about how can we create a diverse workforce because ultimately education is about increasing the capacity, particularly of local talent. And we don't want to create a situation where we're constantly importing. One, it's extremely costly, but two, the basic principle of education of, of increasing the capacity of locals will be missed if we don't focus on making sure that local talent is infused in reform. Talk a little bit how, how well or how poorly we're doing in creating that local talent. Well, I think, um, I, I would say we're at a C minus, if we put a grade on it, and, and it's because there's clearly folks who um, are wedded to programs. Um, and that, for me, breaks a ver the, one of the essential principles of the reform here in New Orleans, that's around autonomy. We should be choosing 
uh, people indiscriminate of where they're trained. We should find um, great people from the universities, great people from Teach for America, great people from other alternative certification programs. But it seems to me that many schools are saying, I don't want anything old. And then you have uh, uh, the other side saying, I don't want any of these young teachers. And that's just a recipe for disaster because what we tried to get away from is getting out of sort of taking from the monopolies of the world, saying we, we have to take this group or this other uh, or this nonprofit or, or this union-based um, initiative. The goal of, 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 of autonomy, in my opinion, is having the ability to pick freely so, and, and to have the range of talent at your disposal. But I, I really think school leaders are not um, taking advantage of the autonomy um, that they have. Now, some, some have said, well, a, a problem here is all these young, out of, not foreigners, but young, non-native whites coming in to mm -hmm. rescue New Orleans. Right. So, I wonder if that, if to talk about sort well, of- Well, we need it, you know, one, we needed change. I mean, clearly, um, folks were not um, getting the types of education that that's needed to succeed in life. Um, people were not self-actualizing. So we needed new people, new ideas. So um, you would never hear me say w that we don't need new people. However, we don't need people that is so service-driven that once they feel that their service obligation is over, they leave. You know, we need folks who really want to commit to education for the long haul. And, that, and, and again, I don't want to say that we need teachers to commit for 20 years. That's just, there's a new age. But we do need folks who, who want to um, commit to the city. And so what I find distressful is when folks come and they leave. But we have to make conditions better um, in the city for people to stay. So it's all, it takes two to tango. It takes a city to embrace folks. But it also takes us to be committed to creating incentives for people to want to stay and to, um, and to lock in. You know, when you're saying that you have a two-year commitment for, or a two- or three-year commitment, people are only going to stay two or three years. You know, we've got to create housing initiatives where folks can buy homes here. We need to create um, retirement packages that um, are more likely uh, to inc well, increase the likelihood of people to stay. We need to cr um, and create incentive packages, again, to, for, to create adorable residents. And, um, and that's because we need the talent, but we need pa talent to stay and commit to not only a city, but to a profession. You have the six charters in your network. Um, can you talk a little bit about you know, how well some have done and how some have been disappointing? Everyone? Oh, yeah, I think, um, and, and I'll speak for the four that we're directly um, responsible for. I think um, two are very strong and two are um, improving, but not at the rate that we would like for them to, to improve. And I think a lot has to do with leadership, and I can um, take credit and blame for that, um, because one thing I found that if there's not cohesion from top to bottom, you really miss opportunities to grow. Um, this reform is in part about having schools become communities of sort, that um, the students, the principals, the, the parents, the leadership are all on the same page. Um, it's not like a, a bank where you go in, you get some information, you leave. The, it's a more of a community where people um, are, um, have common goals, they know what's going on. And I think when there's not that cohesion, um, you're not as likely to succeed. And I think the, the schools that we manage, the ones that have that cohesion are doing well. The others that struggle in terms of teacher attendance, student attendance, parent participation, um, participation from um, local businesses and, and churches, they struggle. But When you say doing well, are you... I mean, I, I'm, I'm fascinated by this definition of the search for excellence, but it seems like it, it comes down to leap scores. Right, but I tell you, I'd say all the time, the goal of reform is not to increase test scores. It's, it's to 
graduate folks from college, particularly from a university provider, if we're not getting kids into college, then something's horribly wrong. And so I always have to reframe my colleagues' um, statements around success. If we're not improving the basic life outcomes of these kids and their families, then what the heck are we doing? We're supposed to decrease crime, murder rate. We're, we're, we're supposed to um, give folks the ability to have a job. We're supposed to um, create safe communities where um, our folks are interacting um, and, 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 and conversing, using good language, if I can say so. I mean, these are the basic goals. And I think what we're seeing is certainly we're seeing an improvement in terms of test scores. But I, I still worry that if we don't focus on these very basic life outcomes, um, that we may miss the point of improving education. Some people have been say, are saying, well, this intense focus on test scores may get in the way of some of the other stuff. Oh, yeah, they do. Because, you know, one of the things that um, I'm very concerned about when you go to public meetings, we're still yelling, throwing diatribes at each other like Spears in the same way we did pre-Katrina. We still haven't figured out the relationship between education and crime. Every time I see a school-age child either um, accused of murdering someone or, or, or who's murdered, I always go, where did they go to school last? You know, these kind of basic things we have got to solve for. And so um, I don't want the, the conversation to completely focus on test scores because that actually falls into the, that whole market-driven, you know, a data sheet or Excel spreadsheet sort of type of uh, reform. And, and education is much broader than that. We just don't have the... Um, the sophisticated language around improving education, I mean, or, or analyzing education um, in that way yet. Excel-driven spreadsheet, I, I'm not sure I understand. Yeah, I mean, you, you can, if you score a certain score on a, on a LEAP test, you're considered a success. As, and I can tell you right now, um, we have lots of schools who are improving in terms of their LEAP or the state standardized um, high stakes tests, but their ACT scores have, um, are pretty stable, have not changed at all. And again, the goal is not just to, to see test scores um, go, go up, state, state test scores to go up, while you don't, we didn't increase their capacity to get into selective colleges and universities. And that has a lot to do with um, making sure that our, the, the, the higher ed standards of ACT and SAT um, comport with the high stakes tests. And we're, we're starting to make sure those, uh, those tests jibe. But again, the, but the, the point being is that the goal is not just to increase test scores. Well, I guess what Sarah Usdin has said that, that the possibility that the, the interest in innovation and the pressure for test scores were in conflict and that there was so much pressure to get test oh, scores that some principals uh, or charters, you know, we're, we're not going to try that new thing. I mean, talk a little bit about innovation and pressure. Oh, yeah. I mean, we, we say we want the arts in school. We say we want folks to visit college campuses and we say we want um, more parental involvement, but we will punish a school um, through media, through um, taking away the, 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 the school through um, incentives from other groups if they don't score a, uh, a, at a certain level. And that's real pressure. And so what you find um, um, is a lot of schools really looking the same, that they are um, a, a lot of time on task. You see a lot of iterative assessments that are built around the leap. So kids are constantly taking tests and and that can be damaging because and clearly when you're taking tests, you're not spending as much time learning the theory, learning the deeper lessons that come along with that math lesson. And um, it's, we're on a very slippery slope because you want to give students the deeper lesson because ultimately that's going to have them succeed later in life. It's not uh, getting a, a perfect score on the leap is not the goal. It's to succeed in life. 
And if, we're, if they're missing the lesson, the deeper lesson, in order to get a higher score, then that's a problem. In your own schools? Um... Oh, yeah. We, we, we've fallen somewhat into the trap of um, making sure that t uh, tests go up, t scores go up. And um, we're not as cohesive, in my opinion, between our um, university and the schools, because when you have a university provider, the thing that you want to do is making sure that kids are being exposed to college level courses. We have that in an early college high school. Um, but uh, where I think colleges of education, the future of it is to figure out what kind of curriculums will middle school and elementary schools need in order to do well in college. And, and that's what I think um, colleges of education and, and universities in the main have to spend more time on is figuring out that what, uh, what kind of curriculums are, um, will make this pipeline from pre-K through graduate school um, more, um, more fluid. And, and we've got to do a better job of that. One of the things that, that people have been saying um, is that some charter schools are, are playing fast and loose with the, with the rules. They're uh, counseling out or finding reasons to get rid of special ed kids or kids who just aren't going to do well on the test. I, mean, I wonder, could, you know, you, you're a charter yeah. operator and you're sort of watching could you talk a little bit about the, the rules and who's following them? <laughs> yeah, I think there's just, I'll put it this way, there's not enough incentive to keep the most problem kids. You know, I, 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 I think we have rules in place that um, will hurt you in terms of your, your test scores if you kick out a kid or in a certain time. However, I think folks are willing to take that risk because what I, I do believe, it's a cohesion around a school community that helps prepare, uh, propel the entire school. And so if you have five, seven kids in your school that's breaking up that cohesion, it might behoove you to, um, to counsel out. And I do believe that occurs. I don't think it's as rampant as um, folks um, um, will suggest. I do think push out has been a problem in all school districts prior pre-Katrina because and that's where I think the problem is oftentimes we characterize the the push out problem as a post-Katrina phenomenon when push out has occurred um, for decades now in, in our public school system. So push out means push out means um, if you have a kid who exhibits a lot of behavioral problems who's not doing well academically who um, on your on your role hurts you in terms of your overall school performance. Um, and so you create mechanisms to encourage a student to leave. So you expel them, you um, give them long-term expulsions, you meet with the parents, you have them create um, very rigid contracts um, that outlay the conditions uh, on their, um, their, their stay in the school. These things really um, are dangerous in the sense of we're supposed to be public in education and the reform was built around we're supposed to ch teach every child. We got to learn how to teach every child. And so for me, I don't ever want to lose that ethic that we started off with because if we start to say not every school can teach every child, then you're going to create an alternative for the alternative. We're supposed to be the solution. We're supposed to find um, a, a solution to the, um, this great responsibility that we're bestowed upon and to teach every child in public education. How is, how is your group done? I mean, you know, got a top oh, kid. Yeah. I, I, you know, I rarely get involved in operations um, in terms of telling principals what to do. But the one area that I have been pretty consistent, I, I just think it's a last resort to expel a child. I think it's last resort when you're giving long-term suspension. So I'm proud to say that um, our school leaders rarely expel children um, and rarely um, create these conditions where it's almost impossible for them to stay. I would rather um, have a lower score knowing that we've made every attempt 
to teach every child than to have incredible scores knowing that we pushed out 20, 30 kids in the process. It's almost like you somehow have to have an ethic that is, gee, if I couldn't get through that kid, I failed. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. But there's so many incentives. You know, when you are, um, when you have a certain score in this city, you will get accolades not only from the state, but celebrities, cameras. Um, you'll, you'll get many different rewards, tangible and um, intangible rewards from that success. But real success comes from when you've uh, basically proven that you've taken in every child and you've give, given them the best experience they could have. That's real success. And I'm, I'm, I'm proud of our school leaders in a sense of, you know, they may not be in the top five. They may not be in the, the top quartile. But when I, at the end of the day, when I see that they had very few expulsions, um, many students have stayed throughout the year, that's success. We, you know, another major statistic that we really have to focus on uh, in the, in, over the next five years, we gotta look at teacher attendance and student attendance because those are proxy for quality. When, when you have a, a great school, students tend to come. And when you have a great school, teachers tend to stay. And I think those kind of um, um, statistics are vitally important to really judging how good you are. It sounds like the system has some perverse incentives. Instead of rewards for keeping kids, you... Well, I think the perverse incentives come from um, a severe fa perverse failure. And so we had to cr create rigid sort of uh, criteria to say, prove that you're doing what you're doing. And there's such pressure to change because if you have a kid in a failing school, for more than a year, two years, you're, you're setting up that child for serious failure, that community for serious failure. And so the, the disincentives are perverse, but they come out of perverse failure. So it's, it's, that's not a, um, it's hard to get out of this um, either or, this right and wrong phenomenon. It's really a muddled situation, very complicated. And that's why you do need school leaders, superintendents that have a lot of discretion in looking into to school leadership, um, performance on the case-to-case -case basis. The, the, the question of special ed, um, a number of critics have said, well, privatizing and educating special needs kids are mutually exclusive notions because it costs more money to educate a Mm -hmm. Kid with special needs, and you only get some. I mean, could you, you know, you run a network? Talk a little bit about that, the special ed situation. Well, I think uh, again, another conversation that is lost in this entire debate around special ed. We need the entire public school community to advocate for more resources for special needs kids, and we also need for us to um, use this opportunity to rethink who is a special needs student and who's not. There's been a horrible tradition in many states and many districts of labeling. It can't be that 70-something percent of the kids who are special ed are black male. That is genetically impossible. And so just based on that, you know, I always say, let's, let's rethink what we do. Um, let's really go back to say when we have children with um, severe um, to mild disabilities, let's analyze what it takes, how much it costs, Let's create um, new um, uh, places for folks to, to get the services they need. But we can't start the conversation with, um, you're not providing services for this ki kid, and you, can't, you don't have even the structure to, to, prov um, to provide these services. When in fact, before the storm, <laughs> that school didn't serve these kids and did not have the structure. And, 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 I, and I just think that we're now at a place where we've talked in the New Orleans about restructuring everything. There, we can use this as an opportunity to reframe how we serve special needs kids across the country. That's what I would like to begin with because I, I, I just believe that we have not really took a critical look at who's actually special needs, what services do they need, 
and how they're delivered and the cost of those services. I mean, there are people who've said, well, special ed is what I do when I haven't been able to teach you. Absolutely. It can't be my fault. <laughs> that, that's exactly right. That's exactly right. And, you know, and I, I, I know that there are several students in my school and other um, leaders' schools that um, they're not special needs. They, they've just not been served year after year after year. And they're in very stressful communities. Um, and this is how a normal person reacts in these conditions. They're normal. <laughs> they're just under severe conditions at home and in school. That is a normal response. It is not an anomaly in their thinking. It is, that is a normal response. And we have several kids who, um, because of their circumstance, are acting normally. It's not, um, it certainly needs attention, but they're not, um, um, by definition, something's wrong with them. You know, that, that, there, there's nothing wrong with them. They're just responding appropriately to their situation. Now some of the critics of this uh, experiment, or whatever you want to call it here in New Orleans, some of the critics say um, it, it's creating a two-tier system. Mm -hmm. uh, there are the charters that are doing well, which have admission standards and push kids out. Um, and a lot of those kids, the toughest to educate, end up down in the direct-run mm -hmm. RSD schools. I mean, that, that, that crit you heard that criticism. Oh, yeah, yeah. Reflect on that notion of a two, if in fact, a, you know, two tier. Well, I think if there's a two tier system, it's between private, parochial, and public. You know, there are clearly in this city, folks with means want out of the public system and they choose to go out of the public system. I, I think that's clear. Um, and so for me, it's always been how can we attract a, a more diverse socioeconomic class of folks back into public schools and not just the selective test schools. We, we need a more diverse um, regular public school environment. That to me is the problem. It's around socioeconomics. Now when you're talking in the, in the charter school world and the um, non-charter school um, public, yes there's certainly schools who are um, selecting certain schools either on the front end or on the back end. right? They're, but again, I don't want to characterize the entire system as in that way. You will see good charter schools um, who are doing due diligence, and you will see bad ones. In the same way, you had a, a tiered system before. So you had test, uh, um, selective admission schools here before. Um, you had schools that pushed out kids. Um, that exists in many different systems. I don't think there's a st structural issue around um, the, that the charter, the chartering itself creates a two-tier system. I think that the practices of bad schooling create a, a tiered system and that's something we are constantly dealing with. There are people though who say, well, charter schools are the solution. It's maybe not the magic bullet, but charter school, uh, what, what do you say? Charter schools are just a means to an end. They're not a solution. They're not a panacea. It's a way to, to um, create mechanisms to put in good schooling. When people start to say that they're a panacea, that's when you lose. That that's when you start saying let's charter every school, and then you lose focus on quality. Um, I think you know when you look at what makes for a good school, it's talking about great instruction. Um, you're talking about a good curriculum, you're talking about a commitment to children, you're talking about loving children, loving what you do. Um, these kind of things are important. It's, a, it's about controlling your budget, it's about having the resources needed in order to actualize your program, it's about having a certain amount of discipline to what you do. These things can come in a charter, it can come in a magnet, it can come in a traditional school. Um, I just think the flavor of the month is the charter school and, and, and 10, 20 years from now is going to be something else and we always have to reform ourselves because what I see in education is this, 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 um, this constant um, um, fluctuation between or oscillation between highly autonomous schools to highly centralized schools, 
highly autonomous, highly centralized. And there comes a point in terms of cost that you have a centralized thing when you have uh, autonomous schools. And it goes back and forth. And, so, and reform tends to flow with that oscillation. And so um, I don't think that charter schools are the panacea. It's just the, right now the way to get in the schools what's needed in order to be successful. You know, the rest of the country is paying attention to New Orleans. I asked one guy uh, what the lesson is, and he said, well, the lesson is don't do what we did. Uh, but, but, you know, you're, you're a scholar, yeah. public intellectual, CEO. I mean, you're sort of wearing right. all these hats. Uh, when someone says, Andre, uh, what have we learned? You know, talk, talk to me about what what New Orleans has, or what you Oh, I, I certainly have learned when there's a focus on public education, public education can change. Um, I don't think anyone can dispute that the attention applied on public schooling has changed us and improved us in the main. Now, there's problems in that process, but the point being that um, a lot of people talk, uh, give lip service to public education while they're sending their child to a, a, a private institution. And I think right now, and this in New Orleans, you actually have people who could care less about who the next super public superintendent is. Uh, could care less about who Andre Perry was, but now they care. And I think what we've learned is that change is possible when investment and intention is given. Um, the other thing I've learned, I think there's a balance of, um, that we should strive for in terms of um, decentralizing and the rate of decentralization, um, meaning um, that the school, the old school board model, where um, you have seven people, maybe eleven people, controlling a hundred and or maybe five hundred schools, um, that model is over. You need a, um, in order to provide the attention needed, in order to change many of um, the ills of, of a school is to break it down so that someone can be responsible for a school. And that's not a, a charter phenomenon. That goes back to um, our original um, conceptualization of schools. Remember that school districts used to be very small, neighborhood-based. You had people who were from the local community um, um, dictating the direction of a school. And I think um, uh, certainly there's a lesson around we need to, to um, come back to those very basic principles of re responsibility, self-determination, um, self-reliance that comes with giving people responsibility for a school. Not this esoteric notion of, you know, I control a hundred and something schools. <laughs> no, you don't. You are a bureaucrat that facilitates some, but um, we need people to be responsible for a school. And, um, if, and, and the other lesson is, that don't, if, don't reverse and go backwards um, by saying, oh, we, we're a charter management organization. You then recreate some of the conditions that you despise. Once you start taking on a certain number of schools, and I don't want to put a number on it, but once you have a range of schools, you you're the, say you're the CEO, or the, you are now a bureaucrat. I mean, you're not directly touching. Um, and there has to be a space for a, sort of a mom pa notion of schooling where one school, one leader, a, f a family of, of, of students come together and try to educate. And, and we need space for that. But national standards at the same time? I do think we need some national standards, but I don't want to make them as rigid um, and as confining that you lose the ability for states and districts to take advantage of their situation. There's, there's some things about Louisiana history that Louisianians should know and appreciate that is different than the history of someone from Pittsburgh, PA. Um, when you're talking about knowing Andrew Carnegie or Louis Armstrong, there's a deep history in both cities that are tied to the deep social political context of each environment. And so when you're talking about how do you construct a history course, right? What national standard do you use? And so certainly it's easier when you're talking about math. 
certainly um, about science, but when you're talking about applying math, applying science, the social political context in which they occur, you need nuance. So I do think you need, um, in general, a way to test to see where everybody is, but not a way to limit the amount of, of context that's needed in order for people to grow. You're a, you're a professor and you give grades, so uh, you know, here we are, five years, you know, this, yep. this experiment, uh, give it a grade. I will say, uh, and, I'll, and I'll say, and I know people will probably get mad at me, but um, every day I pick up um, a newspaper and I see another child murdered, another a family without health care, another family without um, opportunities that I have. Um, I, I constantly say, maybe a C, because my goal in this was not to, um, to get high test scores. It, it's always been that p to, to give people the capacity to do for themselves. And right now we have pockets in New Orleans. They might have better educational options, but they're no closer to being self-reliant than we, they were before. The goal is not to increase test scores, it's to improve the, the, the life outcomes of families in New Orleans. And so I will always be hard on, on our educational enterprise, if these if I can still pick up the paper and I see little Johnny getting shot, I'm just not compromising on that. There are individuals that will, will ask you for grades. Uh, you know, Paul Vallis yep. you know, came in, having run big city systems, and now he's left. How? Tell me how you think Paul Vallis did. I think Paul Vallis, um, he did his job. I think I, I missed him being Paul Vallis because I certainly think um, the number of places he's, he's been, he kind of offered up a straightforward um, market-driven approach to reform that I think we wanted to set in place prior to him coming, but he, had to, he just had the know-how to do it. Um, but I do think that if he was setting the agenda. He probably would set a different agenda. I don't understand. I think that um, we needed somebody after the storm to really implement the agenda that um, the sort of the charter school movement embodied, right? And he had experience in that. But he also knows the trade-offs. Um, because this guy's been to Philly, Chicago, Haiti, <laughs> all over the world, you know. So he also knows the pluses and minuses of taking on these initiatives. But I do think, in the main, we are not much different than what they're trying to do in other places. We're just on steroids. <laughs> like we're just doing it at a much rap more, uh, more rapid, a more expansive um, um, pace and, and condition. But... I, would, uh, I don't know what Paul Vallis would do if he was given free reign. You know, um, I don't think he was given free reign because I think this is an agenda that um, comes straight from the governor to the superintendent to um, um, Bessie, and we needed someone to fill that role, and he filled it well. Now, um, I. And again, I, I always want to know, what if he was governor? You know, he's always trying to get a, a run for governor or something. <laughs> what if he was governor? What would he say? What would he do? Um, and I don't know if he would do anything different. I just um, think, given all these places he've, he's been, he would give a different flavor. He didn't call the shots Paul. Well, let's, you got another Paul. Yeah. He had a double Paul and here. That, yeah. Uh, so That's right. <laughs> give... Uh, Paul Pasterak, your sense of uh, the job he did. Oh, I, I like the job Paul did because um, given the political context, he's working for a um, very conservative governor who, um, who his base does not like this market-driven reform stuff, but he's found a way to even um, impact North Louisianians and folks who um, think that should only occur in New Orleans. He's been able to seek reform in areas that you wouldn't typically 
um, see reform, or it's, it's very politically convenient to, to impose this stuff on New Orleans, but he's doing it all over the state. So in that regard, he's, he, he's done a splendid job. Um, and he's very sympathetic towards black children. I, you know, one thing I, I, I think is missing in a lot of other states, I'm from Pennsylvania, you, you, um, you hear about cutting higher ed by 50%. Um, you, you, I, I've been in other states where it's all about, I'm not here to make friends. I'm not here to, um, to, to make nice. They come in the door saying that. Paul, I think, says up front, I actually care about black children and black uh, Causes. And let me give you an example. When it came to um, the corporal punishment laws, Paul was first to step up to say, hey, you can't just beat kids um, for behavioral problems because you know what? They're more likely to be black men. They're more likely to have circumstances that won't keep them in school. And so while he may not have won many of the battles, he certainly changed the policy to make it difficult to exercise corporal punishment. And that just shows to me that he actually cared about um, black children because there are clear, in my mind, there are clear examples where we're building policy around control of black children and the problem of black children as opposed to seeing them as, as equal and potentially equal as, it, as it any of us. I'm not sure I understand that. Well, like, um, when I walk into schools and I see um, you know, white lines painted everywhere, people don't realize that while they're asking kids to walk along a white, a white line and to, and so that they can have a sense of discipline and order, that that same white line is painted in prison. You know, that, and, and culturally, that's just insensitive. <laughs> you know, and you gotta have a global perspective. You gotta at least know what's going on in the larger sociopolitical context to see that, hey, maybe there's another way for me to instill discipline than putting in a white line, particularly if my daddy has gone to jail and that's what I'm used to, you know? So, you know, it, it, and I think Paul, Pastorek. Paul Pasterek had a greater, and I actually think Paul Vallis had a, a, a more global perspective as well, because when you're so ideological, you say, oh, this school unit has done this and it's proven successful, that's what we're going to do, <laughs> right? No, that doesn't necessarily mean it's right. You look, you um, try to have um, someone who can actually bring wisdom into the equation. So they can say, hey, maybe there's a different way to instill discipline without instilling punishment. And that's just one example. Yeah. Race is, uh, it's not the elephant, well maybe it is, it's the elephant in the room. It's oh, certainly absolutely. not, it's always there. Oh yeah, be, yeah, absolutely because, and it's true, this is about educating poor black children in New Orleans. Um, large, and you can make a case that it's about educating poor black and Latino children across the country because folks with means, and it's more likely for you to have means if you um, come from a middle class family, if you um, live in the suburbs, that it's more likely that you'll have a quality school nearby. So these issues don't touch you. And so a lot of these um, initiatives directly impact our response to how blacks are, and Latinos are receiving a, an education and the cost of not giving them an education. The, the problem being is that uh, many of these initiatives are, 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 are felt that it's being done to the black community and not involving the black community. And in, case, in some cases, that's, that's true. And so we've got to figure out that the ultimate goal, again, is for communities to be self-reliant. It's not just to fix education and for, and, and for folks to say they fixed it. It's to give folks the capacity to help themselves. That's the ultimate goal. Does it does it feel here in New Orleans like it's being done? Oh yeah, it is. I mean, it is being done. Um, many of the policies that are in place are um, done at the highest levels, you know, in, in the in the chambers, not with a lot of community input. And um, we've got to change that. It, it, now we've always had you know political elites making decisions, but 
when you're talking about education, we actually need parents to understand what's going on. Is the model of charter school is transparent, open, involve the community. You, that's, that's not always happening? Oh, no, not always happening because um, the, um, the, when we originally started um, opening charters, we had charter leaders present themselves to the community. They took a lot of heat. Um, There's a lot of questioning. And along the way, we, we've, we've, we've recognized some success and we've said, hey, let's, let's short circuit some of this stuff and let's just get some charter schools in here. And many leaders have not been introduced to the community the way they should have. Because I do think parents ultimately want a better school, but they also want to, some voice in who runs the school. And so it's just a matter of doing due diligence and saying, look, this is what I have to offer and seeing the community as partnered. But the need for speed to expand short circuits community partnership and, and deliberation with the community because it takes long, it's, it's often ugly and messy and there's a lot of yelling and uncomfortability, but we gotta do that. The, the stated goal of some folks is 100% charter schools. It's now, I guess, 70% of the kids yeah. are in charter schools. Talk a little bit about that idea of this eventually perhaps being a system of all charter schools. Well, I, I think we need a, a, a diverse system of schools. And the, what makes, um, what I think, if we can say we're successful, is that we have such a mixed bag of, ch of charter, traditional, parochial, private. And if you really want choice, right, it's about having the range of types because that there's cross-pollination between the two that occurs. And I, I don't want to say that we should be all of anything because that's what got us in trouble in the first place, <laughs> right? We were all this. So I really believe is let's have some diversity. Let's make sure that we have strong um, parochial schools, strong private schools, strong public schools, uh, strong public schools that are charter. Let's make sure that we have someone to say what is an appropriate arrangement in the city. And, the, and again, I think that takes um, so oftentimes a mayor, a, um, a, um, someone who's not invested, university leaders to get involved to say, look, there's an arrangement that gives folks real options. Let's explore those. Last question. We're, we're the media, we're always looking for heroes and villains, you know, somebody right. with a white hat or a black hat. Talk about that notion, is this, is this a story with heroes and villains? Yeah, I think the hero is certainly um, the city of New Orleans. What is not stated enough, it's the families and the communities of New Orleans that have built the system. Um, Certainly, many folks could have stayed where they were, but families decided to come back in mass to help rebuild public education. And as um, school leaders, we love to take the credit, but trust me when I say, many families came with a new renewed spirit, a renewed investment in education. They're actually trying harder. They've learned something from their experiences. They are the heroes of all this, and they don't get enough credit because, again, we want to say, I'm Dr. Andre Perry, I helped save this school from oblivion, look at what happened in the past. But the reality is families come in mass and they commit to a school and they help make it work. And you can't do um, what we do without family support. Um, if there's a villain, I think it's this art nagging inability to, um, to look at the strengths of the old system and the strengths of the new system and bring those things together. We ha still have this traditional reformer sort of um, battle that unfortunately are comprised of the same people that were in battle before. They just have different labels on them. And, um, and they're still there. And unfortunately, until we get rid of this competitive, I'm better than you, um, don't you see what I see and why can't you see it? 
um, you're ignorant on the other. I mean, we'll never be able to take the best of, of both worlds and create a system that is high functioning because it's really going to take a diverse set of ideas, old and new, to come to maximize what we're doing here. Oh, yeah. I work in education because I, it's the only way I know, both personally and professionally, um, to, um, to give someone a fighting chance at the American dream, middle class lifestyle, um, a sense of the good life. I mean, I come from a family. My, you know, my father was murdered in jail. Mother had four children before she was 19, lived in the projects. Um, my, um, my mother gave me to a, an older woman who recently passed um, to take care of me. She raised anywhere between 10 to 15 children. Um, it was sort of an, in, an informal adoption. And she believed in education. And that broke the cycle. Now um, I, I, I have multiple letters behind my name and, and I can, I have more control over my life and I have a greater capacity to help others. That's what education is about. It's, um, for me, it's, it's to say that um, I can now go out and better serve more people. And um, that's why I'm in education. So the one word to describe you is dreamer, idealist, troublemaker? I would say I am a, um, I would say two words, a hopeful pra pragmatist in a sense of, um, I want, I really want to help people in a real way. Um, and education is a very pragmatic uh, enterprise that you can actually help somebody and, but still have ideals. I still have ideals. But education gives me a practical way for people to achieve those ideals.